The Brown Park Podcast is brought to you by Grow Clinics. They're Australia's leading hair transplant clinics, and you can go to growclinics.com.au. So today's guest. Oh, hello. G'day, mates. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> no lube on that one. You just went straight in. Straight, straight in, a raw dog, yeah. <laughs> so today's guest has played a role or has helped you. Absolutely. Um, the, 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 we're talking to Sam Webb, who was one of the founders of Livin, and Livin has definitely done a lot for mental health. And, and um, the, the phrase, it ain't weak to speak, has helped a lot of people, myself included, um, with being able to talk about depression and anxiety and all that kind of stuff. And we'll get into that very shortly here on the Brown Park Podcast. The Brown Podcast. Question. What do you got for me today? Okay. Like flu and it's mm. cold and flu season. It's been ravishing, ravaging everybody, right? Not ravishing, mm. ravaging everybody. <laughs> ravaging. Um, um, yeah, it's been getting <laughs> sexy with my face. Um, I've had it. Uh, my boys got it. I've known, I've had a friend that's been in hospital with it, with pneumonia. Um, it's really sort of struck everybody at the moment. Are you the type of person that takes a cold and flu medicine or do you go, no, nah, I'm going to ride this wave and let it get rid of it itself? I don't get sick. I rarely, rarely get sick. But on the off This chance... time next podcast, you are going to be so <laughs> ill. It's ridiculous. I'm going to sound like you did last week. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not real. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take the nighttime medication generally to, to take the edge off so I can sleep. But yep. no, not really. No, I'm not usually a... Uh, uh, pill popper in that sense you, you like to just ride it out and go yeah i'm gonna just let this snot run well i don't mean i've, I've had covid and that and it like it, it affected me but not dramatically I, mm. I think i've only ever been genuinely really sick with the flu like when i was 18 and that would be the only time i don't think i've ever felt sick enough to actually take a day cold and flu it's got something to do with your diet because you don't eat vegetables or, well, you eat fruit, but you don't eat vegetables. I don't eat much fruit, but yes, no, definitely no veggies. Apart from potato occasionally, but yeah, no veggies. It's a textural he, thing. He never eats veggies. Like he'll order a hamburger and it'll be, please leave off the lettuce and tomato and onion and anything that might be actually good for me. Well, I'm not a rabbit. I don't want to eat lettuce. I mean, my might hump like a rabbit, but not, uh, I don't enjoy to eat lettuce and tomato and that. Just don't like it. Yeah, look, see, and I don't get sick, so as you were. I'm still stuck on the humps like a rabbit and how we're leaving that in the final cut of the podcast sucked in. <laughs> the Brown Box Podcast. Today's guest uh, is very important when it comes to the space of mental health. Um, he's not only uh, uh, the, one of the founders of Livin, um, he's also an author. He's been on Survivor. He's been recently married, and his name is Sam Webb. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, uh, Dion Dave, for having me on. I'm looking forward to it, and I uh, yeah, appreciate it. Whereabouts are you guys right now? Gold Coast. Yeah, Gold we, Coast, both of you? Yeah, yeah, both of us. Gold, well, nice. we, we live about 25 minutes from each other, but um, to podcast, we ju- it's just easier sometimes. We just go, oh, well, let's just do it online, and uh, that way we never actually have to communicate with each other in person. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's good, eh? A bit, bit, bit easier that way, no confrontation. Whereabouts in the Gold Coast do you guys live? Uh, I'm in Rabina, and I'm up okay. in Coomera. Nice, nice. Yeah. Because no, you've spent quite a bit well. of time here. This is the yeah, home yeah, base. I, this home base yeah, for I living. Up, yeah, yeah. I grew up in in the Gold Coast and spent most of my life there before I went back to Sydney in yeah. 2014. So I went to school there and went to uni at Bond and yeah, Livin's based in Burley. I think that yeah, they've just moved. So now, and you're in you're in West Hollywood. I'm in West Hollywood in LA. I've been here since 2019, just before the pandemic. So. Um, yeah, mate, it's been good. I, the weather's kind of come out today. It's been terrible. Unlike LA, yeah. it's been rough, but mate, it's, it's good to be here. And, um, always, it's always interesting. That's for sure. The only time I was in West Hollywood, we were out at a nightclub and these guys said, Oh, come on back to our house, guys. So we, I don't, I don't know where the hell we went. And, um, it was, I don't know, like one o'clock in the morning and up this dude's house. And I said, Where are we? And he goes, You're in West Hollywood, man. I'm like, well, fucking all right, if you say so. I had probably, no probably, idea. Up in the, probably up in the hills somewhere, mate. I, yeah. I, I, I don't even know. It was a nice house, and um, it was like 5 o'clock in the morning. I said, all right, I'll get, get back, staying down at Santa Monica, and I remember just hopping in the hopping in the cab and um, just in this traffic with just red taillights 
that direction was like worst worst traffic I've ever seen in my life. But worst, um, yeah. yeah, it's you got to definitely got to pick and choose. You're traveling here in the car because if you pick the wrong time, you you proper cooked. But yes, sometimes yeah. it's great. Like if you go between like 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., so it's like a small window. It's generally really good. But yeah. if like morning, like five, six, seven o'clock is terrible. So if you work in the grind, it'll get you. Like yeah, a nine to five, cooked, mate. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you don't, mate. LA. I don't think anyone works a nine to five. I reckon everyone works from home, or they just commute. Like, no, nah, it's a it's a zoo over here, as you know. People <laughs> are just doing their thing, creating stuff, and nah, it's wild. So, so what's what's life got for you over there at the moment? What are you doing? Because I mean, I know you were on Survivor just recently in Australia and 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 stuff like that. But um, but but what are you? Have you you set up house there? You're living there now permanently. Yeah, yeah, definitely living here permanently. I just got married to Nadia, um, yep. so it's I've been kind of in limbo for the last few <laughs> few weeks. To be honest, um, there's just been you know planning for that, making sure it was an amazing time. We got married down in Mexico, so I had like eighty people from Australia fly over, including the family and all my close friends. So it was that a wild, wild time. Yeah, yeah, mate, it was it was it was <laughs> the best day of our lives and worth worth every bit of stress leading up to it and. Um, we've kind of just been in limbo. Nadia obviously does her work. I'm, I'm still doing a bit of podcast stuff for living. My roles, um, I've stepped down from living from a formal capacity, uh, yep. just recently. Um, I do pursue other things. So I'm an actor. Um, and I'm also, yeah, I like doing mental health advocacy work through speaking and all that sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, currently in the process of, um, my next career venture, so to speak, probably more of a, a full time role. Um, oh, that's intriguing. And, and that, yeah, 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 it is. So I'm excited. i got to keep it under wraps for now until the deal is oh. settled. But, um, mate, it's, it should be good. It should be great. And, and I'm excited. But it's all in the health and wellness space. And, um, yeah, I, I love that area. But, no, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. I mean, it's hard over here uh, just because it's hard in a number of ways, obviously, the career, like when I'm in arts entertainment, and and mm. that's what you guys do. And you said you're on radio and whatnot. So, um, yeah, you feel so close to it, yet you're so far away from it. If yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just trying to work on my craft right now, and I'm enjoying it, mate. I, I just enjoy the industry. I love creating stuff, and being here in LA is everyone's got ideas, and people are trying shit and failing at stuff and trying again. It's just it's it's a good supportive network. I like it. Yeah, so I want to ask, living in West Hollywood, you would see some stuff. What Straight off the top of your head, what's the weirdest thing that you've seen in WeHo? Because oh, mate. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy <laughs> area. I've seen some of the wildest <laughs> shit you've ever imagined. But one thing that I always tell people whenever I'm having a laugh and they go, what do you mean that happened? I go, yeah, yeah, it definitely happened. So I was on the way to the gym one day um, when I used to go to LA Fitness on Hollywood Boulevard, right mm-hmm. by the theater and where they do Oscars and shit. And I'm like, I'm walking past. So I live on off Sunset, and then it goes La Brea. And I shit you not, man. And I, I swear, my hand on my heart, there was a guy at the traffic lights on a fucking horse, <laughs> literally had a horse, no <laughs> shirt, no shirt on a full blown horse next to cars at a red light with an American flag, no shirt, and just I don't know what he was doing. He was definitely not, it wasn't embraced or anything by police. He was a wild dude on a horse on a proper main road here in Los Angeles. It was wild. But I've seen other crazy (laughs) stuff too, man. Like, um, you know, obviously homeless is very big here and and crime is probably through the roof. But yeah, just, it's, it's, every day is very interesting. The the funniest thing I've I've learned about LA is you don't necessarily see the crime. The crime is not very much Mm. in your face all the time. And everyone goes, Oh, it's such a violent city. And it's like, you don't actually see it. You know that it happens, but Mm. you don't really see it. Yeah. It's kind of like the old, uh, the, you know, the dangerous spiders and all the shit that we have back in the city where people always ask over here, Oh, that place is scary. You got like all the dangerous animals, but, as you guys know, we we very rarely rarely see that stuff back home. Well, it's yeah. it's social it, it's social media. It. I mean, if 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 we weren't yeah. so connected to our, our goddamn smartphones and that, we wouldn't see any of the 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 crime and drama that goes on because you'd be living in in the bubble like we did growing up. Like we weren't scared of the mm-hmm. world back then. But um, nah, exactly. <laughs> it's a different place. But now. Yeah, the only place I was scared of in LA was growing up listening to NWA. That was the. Oh. You you always fearful of South like Central. South Central and going into Compton, yeah. Yeah, um, but that's no, not I've even that been. bad anymore, right? Nah, I don't, I don't think so. I think if you 
they say if you go through that at the wrong times, it, it's probably not great if you do, do go through the wrong neighbourhoods. But on the outskirts, like Nadia's done work just in Compton on the outskirts near the mm. freeway and stuff, and it's safe there. But, oh. yeah, I don't know, man. There, there are some rough areas here, but there's rough areas exactly. in Australia. There's rough yeah, areas God, all yeah. over the world, man. But there, I definitely feel like being here, and, and it's one thing when people say, oh, do you miss Australia? And what do you miss most about it? And, you know, I think the beaches and the, the way of life is definitely – nicer and cleaner mm-hmm. and i definitely would say it's very much safer i feel mm-hmm. so much safer at home i there are definitely some areas here where i don't feel great and and mm-hmm. even in the rough suburbs in sydney and and, and western sydney I, I haven't felt that rough so yeah um, i don't know if it's just because i'm from there and i probably trust it more i don't know about here because i haven't i'm not from here so i don't yeah. know maybe that but I love this place because it's very creative. People are, it's, there's no tall poppy syndrome. You can do whatever you want. The rules and the laws are very relaxed. Like I realized when people were like, Oh, is it the land of the free? And I didn't realize what that really meant. Yeah. Until I was here for probably about just under three years. I was like, and then I went back home because I couldn't go home during the pandemic stuff. Mm. And I'm like, fuck, man, we're, we're so controlled back in Australia. Yeah. Like, really there's are. so yeah. many more ro- like rules yeah. and regulations and, that's why I think over here, I say often, like, it's like a zoo. Like, people are just doing whatever they want. It's mm. crazy. Yeah, well, there's legislation after legislation mm. after legislation over here. And Kerry Packer once said, here's an idea for you. Why don't, every time you bring in a new legislation, revoke another one? So every yeah, time you bring yeah, in a new one, you're pulling out an old antiquated one. But, um, mm. yeah, no, no, they just keep dropping them in. Yeah. And then well, you look the at things I picked up. And then you look at like gun laws in America and stuff like that. It's a whole other yeah. conversation, but that's, you know, yeah, it's that's, terrible. that's their legislation has gone wrong. Yeah. <laughs> mate, one thing, mate, I, 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 yeah, I can't stand that shit. And you hear about mass shootings almost every, well, probably once a week, I reckon. And, mm. um, it's like, and they keep saying the same thing. Like the same shit happens. Like the thoughts the and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Your governor's come in, the president, oh, we're going to do something about the gun laws, but it's never going to change no. because all the politics involved, the NRA, like yep. they run the government, all that. It's never going to change. And mm. it's wild though. Like you, like my, my wife's from Kentucky, or her family live in Kentucky, and, yeah, it's literally the most relaxed gun laws in the world. I yeah. And that's one of those states there. Yeah, Vegas they've got open stuff. carry or something, don't they? It's yeah, like you, you don't actually... even have to have a permit. Yeah. Nuts. Yeah, you just go and grab a gun and just walk around on your on your on your hip pocket. I want to know how LA Sam Webb has gone. Tell me what you order for coffee when you go to the coffee shop. Iced almond milk latte. A what? Sorry. Iced almond milk latte. You've gone full LA. Yeah. No. Nah, is it? Is that really <laughs> right? I didn't drink coffee until I lived here. I never drank coffee until <laughs> I think it was like two thousand and twenty one. Yeah, I had yeah. espresso martinis and stuff like for drinks when I'm back yeah, yeah. in Australia. Nice. Yeah. But, but like in my coffee over here, I only go to a, an Australian coffee place called Bluestone Lane, and yeah, I love them. I think that yeah. comes from his time in Burley, mate. So yeah, that, maybe. that's um, <laughs> oh, true, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> Burley's a coffee centric area yeah, of the Gold Coast. Yeah, mate. I um, but I but I do. I don't have a coffee every day. I definitely I probably have two or three a week for sure. But. Um, yeah, that's my go-to when I'm getting them. Good one. Already sucked back one, then there's another one on the <laughs> way. <laughs> he pours it into his eyeballs, this guy. Yeah, you, yeah you'll, I really be wide, you'll be wide, mate. <laughs> well, it's still, it's only early it's in the morning right. here, so I'm like, that needed it yeah, to wake up. Need, need another one. Round Pock. Grow Clinics is Australia's most trusted hair growth clinics. I was at a meeting during the week. Okay. And as I walked up, one of the ladies in the meeting has gone, holy Hell, you look like a completely different person. Did you say, I feel like one? I said, I feel like one. She goes, oh, that is just insane. I have not seen you since you've had the hair done. That is crazy. It looks good. And I'm like, thank you, I'll take that. But there was another guy that was standing there who was bald. Oh, And no. he's like, he's like, I followed your journey and have been debating it and have been wanting to talk to you about it. So we got into a conversation about how Grow Clinics works, how the hair transplant works, what they do for you, how you go about getting your hairline back. He shaves his head because he's like, I don't like the look of it. And I'm like, Mm. go and have a chat to the team at Grow. Well, can I just quickly tell you how they do it? So they take the little hair follicles from the back of your head that are resistant to the DHT hormone. So they take the little follicles out and they put them up top 
So they, they plug in these little follicles. They don't look, it doesn't look like plugs or anything like that. It's just, absolutely it com- not. it looks completely natural and it's there forever. And that's the one question somebody said that said, oh, is it plugs? And I'm like, no, it's you. It's my own hair that's been transplanted back onto the places where my head decided hair shouldn't grow. Mm-hmm. Grow Clinics offer all of the most effective scientifically tried and tested hair loss treatments perfected by their team of experts to deliver leading results. No matter the stage of your hair loss, they can help. Find the solution that's right for you. Go to their website, growclinics.com.au and tell them that Brown Park sent you. The Brown Park Podcast. Talk to us about the Sam Webb story. I mean, like your work with Livin has been fairly prolific. Uh, a lot of people know the Livin story. You lost a friend to suicide and, and, and that changed your pathway pretty much in life, right? Mm, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, Livin started in 2013 after we lost a real good friend, uh, Dwayne, his name was, Dwayne Lally, uh, to suicide and I used to like just a bit of backstory. I played football and um, very competitive and in opposing sides for the most part with Dwayne. And, but we, we were quite similar in a way that we were just, you know, just, just, just your young Aussie knockabout larrikins. Like we, we had fun, but we, we also probably ventured on the gray area of life and, and, mm. you know, just did silly, stupid things at times, but had great times and had great intentions. And wasn't until 2013 that I'd come back from America and my first, um, I actually moved to America for 12 months doing a, um, worked in like asset management and did uh internship for Wells Fargo because I had a banking background. I can't believe I even did that. Anyway, <laughs> um, came back to Australia and my life at that time, I spiraled. I was in a relationship and I spiraled. I like got off all my antidepressants and I was in some of the worst times of my life. In 2013, up until uh, another story, which I'll share with you, but up until probably the start of this year, late last year, some of the worst times of my life. Really? And um, well, it was the worst time of my life. Yeah, 2013 was rough. And yeah, and I hung, hanging out with the wrong people on the Gold Coast, very mm. easily swayed, wasn't being the best version of myself. I was working, but I, and I was pretty good at it. I was working for uh, Southern Cross Osteria at the time as an account manager and just learning um, the ropes for on-air radio for like uh, the weekend crosses and stuff. Yep. And then, um, yeah, it's partying so hard on the weekends and shit and re- reconnected with Dwayne when I got back. Um, and we were always connected even when I was away. I was only away for a year. And, um, yeah, I remember, like, he was in a relationship, but it was kind of off and on. And he used to share with me, you know, how hard, Matt, like, let's go mad on the weekends. And we were always catching up and whatnot. And it was the night of September 15. I'll never forget it because – Dwayne had set up a double date for me, himself, his uh, future fiance, um, and her best friend. And I was already at the time, I, yeah, I was pretty into her best friend. And we were meant to go to dinner at Nobby's actually. And and I remember getting a call after watching a manly game at the Shark Bar, and and Dwayne's like, "Let's scrap the the, the double date. I'm having a party at my place." And this was in Palm Beach, just off Talabudra Drive, to cross the bridge there, and um. So, all right, I'm down for that. Sounds good. I'd already had a few beers deep and, and let's go. Yeah, yeah, just fucking around and yeah, let's go. And then I'm like in the cab. Oh, sorry, his missus and um, the other lady, like her best friend, picked me up and we went to Dwayne's and there was a party at his place. It was only like his good close friends and, and the roommate and their friends. There's probably only 10 or 15 of us there, but it was good. We're watching footy and Drinking beers, everything else that comes after drinking beers when you're at a party. I <laughs> don't know what you're talking about. And, no, no yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, I don't know either. And um, I remember Dwayne opened up to me that night. He called me into his room and said, you know what, Webby, I, uh, yeah, I've tried to take my life twice before. Shit. And I didn't know what to say because I knew that I knew that Dwayne had suffered with mental, like with a mental health challenge or multiple mental health challenges, but I wasn't really, and even understanding that I, I'd been diagnosed with anxiety and depression. I didn't really talk about it. Yeah, mm. I didn't really know how to speak about it. I didn't know what to say, but I just thought in the moment under the influence, what's the best thing I can do and what can I say? And I remember him saying, I'd never do it again. And I was reassuring him that, you know, life is great. It's worth living. And, 
You've got an amazing support network around you. Your family are unreal. Like, I wish I had a family as good as you did. They were still together. It was so close with them and they were very well off. And, and Dwayne was great at his work. And he, from an outside looking in, you, you would never think that he would ever have done that before. Yeah. It was kind of like unbelievable. And, but he's reassured me I'd never do it again. I couldn't put my, pa- my family do that, man. Imagine if that happened. And anyway, the conversation spiraled and, and it went up and down and around and around and, I, th- I thought I listened as best as I could have. I thought I also said all the right things. And maybe I did in the moment. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. But you only know what you know in those moments, yeah. given the time that you have. And I remember leaving Dwayne in that conversation. It would have been, we would have spoke for literally like time flew. It would have been 30 or 40 minutes, you know, when you're locked in in those conversations. You're just going a hundred mile an hour. And I'm, um, I left that room and I went to the couch at the front door of his house and it looks back onto like most of the house. So you'd see anyone coming out the door and I was, I was just hanging out with that girl at the time. And I remember his Dwayne's girlfriend come running out crying, going fucking Dwayne said he's going to go kill himself. What? And he means at this time. And I, I don't know where he is. And he never came at the front door. He don't know, He ran and escaped at the back. And I just, I remember looking everywhere that night for him. You know, I jumped in a car, which I probably shouldn't have, and I was driving around the Gold Coast. I literally yeah. drove around the Gold Coast looking for him that night and messaging him, no responses, messaging him, come oh, man, please don't do anything we spoke about tonight. You know, like, I'm always here. You've got so many people to support you. They'd drop everything to be here. And, mate, I, I couldn't sleep that night. I remember lying back, and I was just staring at the ceiling that whole night. And I'll never forget because the next day was the Floyd Mayweather versus um, Canelo Alvarez fight, and Dwayne's obviously a past professional boxer, and I was, and I'm, an, I'm a big like boxing advocate. Like I love watching; it's my favorite sport. And had a couple of amateur fights, and man, it was just this weird, eerie fucking feeling in the day that day. And uh, I remember people putting this photo up on Facebook and Instagram, and who, if you find him, let us know. And I remember just going back home that night. Mate, we didn't go. I didn't go to the shark bar. It's where we went to watch it together. Dwayne and I were going to watch that fight, the shark bars, him and I. And mate, I got a phone call. I think it was like around six o'clock. And I, I just remember getting the call from one of our other friends saying that he was found. And I was like, "Yeah, where is he?" And um, no, nah, he'd been found dead. Like mm-hmm. he took his life. And I was like, "What do you mean? Like, there's no fucking way." I was just with him yes. twelve hours, like. Mm-hmm. Like less than 24 hours ago, mm. like I was with him, like we're having deep and meaningful combos. He yeah. promised me he would never do that. And like in my eyes, like we're talking to each other, like on a very deep level. And I know Dwayne, like I've known him for many, many years. And I just couldn't believe it, mate. So I had to get in the car that night. I drove up to the hospital and yeah, man, like when they, when you see his family and all the close friends and stuff there and it's not really – about us it's like when you just see his family and the Mm. devastating impact that that's caused there is just it just transcends everything and the moment they pull those curtains back and then you see Dwayne not in living proof in your own eyes is like when it fucking really hits you and Mm. life was forever changed like it it affected me on more levels than one and you know I, I reflect often you know and and from a more of a positive view these days and what it was probably in the in the months and and close years following and I think, what are the things that I could have done or should have done? How could I have done it better? What could I have done better? And they're the things that I've learned today. Yeah. And having my own mental health struggles, I thought I, I thought I would have had all the answers, but I was very wrong. But and you can't uh, blame yourself for something like that because nah, people that are in that situation are going to do it regardless of yeah. what you say or do. You could say all the right 100%. things, which it sounds like you did. They're gonna, they're gonna do it if they're gonna do it. 100%. And then that's the thing. I mean, like, the question is like, did he already have his mind made up? Was that a cry out for some more support? Was he going so mad that night because he knew it was his last night of life? He was so happy, you know, and that yeah. night he was like living his best life. Yeah. And Dwayne always used to say, we're living, man, we're living. And that's where living came from, the name. Yeah. And um, yeah, man, it was just, it was just a passion project at the start, tried to make a change and live and grew into something bigger than I could have ever imagined and, and super grateful to be a part of it for all these years. And and hopefully we've really impacted and changed some people's lives along the way because it certainly helped mine. It definitely, I clung on to living for my own life, to be honest. And Dwayne's passing saved me in many ways. And um, yeah, I'm very thankful for that. And I think Let's- the initiatives like what Livin has done now, 
back had Dwayne spoken before it got to that point and felt open enough. And I think as as men, I mean, everyone's sort of like it, but men primarily, it's there's a lot of masculinity around it. Um, I can't tell you exactly how I'm feeling. You know, I've got to be the man. Um, and I think we're slowly changing that that narrative now. But back then, I don't think it was such a case. Mm. I maybe had Dwayne come to you, you know, six months, 12 months before and said, bro, I'm mm. really struggling. Maybe maybe things may have been different. Maybe it wouldn't have. But, it, you know, the conversation mm-hmm. at least may have helped. 100 100- Definitely. And it's a stigma. You're right. Like there was a lack of understanding. How do I talk about it? Where do I talk about it? And, you know, Dwayne being your alpha male, right? Mm. It's very common. You hear these stories all the time, not too dissimilar to the ones I've had to deal with over the years. Very similar to this whole Dwayne situation. You know, he's, he's one of many. And, you know, given his background and what he stood up for in the community and that, I, I realized why he didn't speak up about it. And no one really knew on a deep level, the struggles that he faced. Yeah. yeah, he'd talk about it and he'd say, yeah, I've got bipolar disorder and struggle with depression, anxiety and whatever else. But it was never more than that. It was just very surface level stuff. Mm. And that's not his fault. It's just as a society, we're not really taught what to say, how to say it, where to say it. So that's why living started. Yeah. So that we could try and bridge that gap between the feeling of what am I feeling? I'm un- I'm lost. I know I'm not alone and we hear this shit all the time, but in those moments you feel that's all you feel is like you're the only one going through that stuff, mm. yeah. you know? And, and, so and then, it's like how can we make people feel less alone? And, and and then knowing how to show up for somebody when they open up to you like that. I mean, mm. I think even now, you know, if Christo came to me and said, hey, I'm, I'm struggling, I'll, you know, maybe I've, I've and tried I to – Well, yeah, but, <laughs> but, you know, I've tried to, you know, commit suicide a few times. I don't know mm. what I would actually say. I mean, maybe I might send him off for help, but – Knowing how to show up for a mate in that moment too, it, it can be awkward for the, the 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 mate on the receiving side of it. Because what do you actually say oh, to yeah. that? Mm, and then you're scared of maybe if I've said the wrong thing. Yeah, that's and then it. You second guess yourself, and you're like, "Well, far out. I won't even say anything at all." I think the best thing you could probably do in those moments though is really just, as a lay person, you know, I get asked this all the time, like, "What's something helpful that you can do to maybe someone that's reached out as a good friend?" and I often say this, right? You don't have to be a professional to help someone. You don't. Mm. If you just listen and listen like with your ears, but listen mm. with your eyes, listen with your heart in a deep and meaningful way, they'll often tell you what they want. Yeah. And even if they don't want you, they don't expect to be fixed right then and there. They just want someone to understand them on a level where they're sort of sitting. Mm. And I think mm. what you can say to someone like that is just being honest is probably the best thing rather than rambling and trying to be problem solver. Yep. Trying to, yeah. Instead of going around in circles and trying to come up with this great idea and great solution, which as men, we like to be problem solvers mm-hmm. and just to fix it. Forget that with this conversation and just be there and kind of listen and say, look, I, I'm going to be honest. This is, I'm grateful that you shared this with me. I, I don't even, I can't even fathom what it must feel like for you. Even if you've got your own anxieties, because I don't know how you feel if you've got anxiety and I do right now. Mm. And I know it might be some similar traits and characteristics, but I don't know exactly how you feel. But thanks to uh, Dwayne Christopher for explaining it to me. Um, I'm going to let you know I'm here for you. Like if you need support yeah. and when you're ready, I just want to let you know as a mate that I'll do whatever I can to get you back on track so you can live your best life. Mm. And if you're not ready now, it's fine. I'm here to listen and just be honest. And if they say something and you don't have the answers to it, just say, look, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I, I actually don't, I don't know what to say. I don't have those answers, but why don't we find them together? Similar situation with, with us. Um, and I, I've suffered depression and I've, I've been at the depths and I'm considering it and, and thinking, yeah, I'm going to do it. Um, never actually did it, never even attempted it, but had the thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I, you know, Dion came along and said, what do you need? What do you want to do? Let's, let's try and help you. Mm. Um, and so we started doing sort of adventures, getting me out of my comfort zone because I'd been very, very comfortable for a long time and never really pushed myself. And I think you mentioned it in one of your jogs that you do when you, when you go for a run, um, just to try and sort of push yourself a little bit because the next day will get better. Um, but like we've, we've done all sorts of different weird and wonderful shit now <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it's, and it's helped my brain space because it made me realize that you actually, there's, there's a lot out there that you can experience and that can bring you a lot of joy and it can make you remember what life is actually about and, and, and why you should be enjoying it and not plumbing the depths of your brain. 
Mm. Because I'm a bit of a loose, because I'm a bit of a loose Uh, unit, and he's quite the opposite. Um, Yeah. So for me, going out having fun, pushing myself, and you know, doing stupid shit has always been something that that I've done. And for him, sitting in his, like I guess in his bubble, comfort zone, very. I mean, that's when his thoughts could run run away with him. I think so. So getting out, having having some fun, realizing that you just you're not just your your family, you're not just a dad, you're not just a uh, husband that there is more beyond that. I think yeah, that's, is, yeah. that's what sort of changed Christo's narrative there. Mm. Yeah. And I, th- yeah, you, you f- you're definitely right. Like the, there is a sense of purpose, I reckon, and meaning that you get from, from trying something that's kind of new. And it's, yeah. it's about having that medium give or take ground. You don't want to do something that's so scary that it leaves you traumatized, but you want to no. do something that makes you feel like you've actually, you're living, you know mm. what I mean? Like, mm. out, like this, and you're kind of not in your mindset. It's like trying to keep busy. I feel like, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but like when you're, when you're complacent or when you're just doing the rounds and you're very comfortable, you end up having so much free time that people like, I know me, like when I struggle with overthinking and, and my own anxious thoughts, like you tend to be sitting in those thoughts for too long and it spirals. Whereas if you keep your mind busy and you keep it stimulated in, in doing something, whether it's something you love or something new, you, you're kind of taken away from those moments. Yeah, mm. yep. And it helps. It, feel, yeah. it definitely helps for me. And I feel like there's something special about that comfort zone and getting out of it. It's great to recluse to it at times, but Absolutely. it's not saying yeah. don't ever be in it. But it's great to be out of it too because you then f- you just feel good about yourself, gain confidence, get better self-esteem, you back yourself and you're like, well, maybe I can do that. That's that's kind of what opens up people's purposes, I reckon. I and think their, so, yeah. Mm. Their, their, their projects of life where they you – know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't – I lack purpose in my life. I fucking hate my job. I'm doing nine to five. I'm over it. It's boring. It's easy. When you when you put yourself in new groups or you meet new people or you go try something very new, might be a group setting or a football team or a, <laughs> that acting classes, whatever. Or in our yeah. case – Go to Chernobyl, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or start a and, podcast. There you go. Yeah, 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 start a podcast, and then and that stuff gives you purpose, and you're like, oh shit! Now I know why they say what purpose is all about. This yeah. is what you're meant to feel. Mm. Yeah, because you feel so lost otherwise, and you just yeah. There's no point just getting by. Well, that's what we did. He ended up going. What do you want to do? Let Let's do something. Let's go on an adventure. And my first thing was like, I've never climbed a mountain, so let's go and climb a mountain. So we went and climbed the uh, Mount Warning. Okay, yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, on Before the it closed Coast. down. Before it yeah, closed down. It. Yeah, not anymore. Um, yeah. um, conquered that. Got over a few fears. And he goes, all right, what do you want to do next? I said, I've always wanted to go to Chernobyl. And he's gone, let's fucking do it. Let's go. So we went out there and <laughs> went to the Ukraine before it was war torn and did that. And it, and, and it's just, it, it gave gave me purpose, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. Beyond, beyond, you know, my three kids and my wife, I should. <laughs> yeah, you call them yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's it's easier said than it's it's all a lot easier said than done too. Like for people who are struggling right now that might be listening to this, that you just it's hard to tell someone just to step out of their comfort zone and they don't really know where to go. Yeah. So I always say start small to start with something that's attainable, something that kind of brings you a little nervous or nervousness or a bit of angst, but not too much and. Just have a crack at it. Have something new, whether it's even reaching out to someone online and sitting, uh, talking to them about how they got to their position at work and whatever. Yep. Like, there's so many ways you can you can attack it. Round punk. Big thanks to our supporters and sponsors of the show, Grow Clinics. We love you. You've been with us from day one, so yes, thank you so I much. Was, I was looking at a photo of myself from pre-grow days. Mm. And I sent yeah. it to my wife, and I went, "Holy hell! How did it get that bad?" Well, because it happens so slowly. So, I mean, if you look at the photos of when you and I went to Chernobyl a few years ago, we're two different dudes. Absolutely, and you can go and check out those photos on our uh, Instagram and, and socials and stuff like that because the results speak for themselves. Um, whether you want to stop hair loss, you can regrow your hair, or maintain strong hair growth, they've got the right solution for you. And you can go to their website, GrowClinics.com.au. Uh, and find the right solution, whether it be the hair transplant, whether it be trying to stave off baldness. They also have a very nice range of products. Their shampoos and conditioners smell delightful. 
They are really good. I really enjoy using them. And they are Australia's most trusted hair growth clinic. So uh, as Australia's leaders in hair loss treatment, they've helped thousands of people grow their hair back for good and they can help you. Hair growth is stronger with Grow. Go to growclinics.com.au and tell them that Brown Park sent you. The Brown Box Podcast. Now, I just want, I want to touch on something you said before that you, you've recently got back on your antidepressants. So you're off them for a little bit. I just want to touch on that as in what made you... So you were on antidepressants, then you stopped. What made you stop? <clears throat> I was on them for five years, going through a uni back when I was on the Gold Coast. It was on 2008, I think, or nine. I started, I got on them. I got on a bunch of different ones and I was like, well, fuck, what is this feeling that I'm feeling? I thought it was just normal. I thought it was just my life that I had. It was just normal. I didn't realize mm-hmm. that it wasn't abnormal. Not that it is abnormal. I'm just saying, like, I didn't realize that. I thought it was just, it was, it was, yeah, I thought it was normal. I thought everyone yeah. had these kind of feelings. Mine were just a little bit exasperated. So I was open. Like I went to see psychologist, psychiatrist. I was doing CBT therapy and had all these small little failures. Ended up getting on Zoloft and it made me feel like a zombie. So I hit, I ended up graduating uni and it made me drink more. And I moved to America for a year. And then I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm sick of, I'm doing all the same stuff, but I'm not really that happy. I wasn't, yeah. I was just kind of cruising. I was just like this zombie that didn't have the high highs, but I never really had any low lows. Like I couldn't feel a lot. Right. Mm. And so I realized for me, that was a bit of a problem. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to type trait off these meds and I'm going to move back to Australia. It was off the, off the whim. And I left at the time, my girlfriend, I was with for a very long time and moved back to Australia. And I remember when I got off of my spiral, I spiraled in that year of 2013, drugs, alcohol, and just doing some bad shit. And I wasn't on anything. No, and and I was then, you know, at the back end of that year after we started living, obviously the tough period of when Dwayne passed, living, as I said earlier, was like a a, a clinging to life for me. He gave me that purpose so that I could feel good in helping others. Hopefully no one else had to go through that. And then at the same time, it actually helped me. Yep. Mm. And so that was this passion project and it was so vibrant and stimulating because we were creating something from nothing. And so I had this, this purpose vehicle that was steering me through life from 2013 all the way up until like 2000 and. 17, 18, and then I left Australia, moved back to Sydney in 2014, and I loved my life there. Like my life went from what was really rough up until Dwayne passed, doing bad shit, involved with bad people. Like, I wouldn't say bad people, it was people that weren't steering me in the right direction, not being true to myself. Mm-hmm. Went to Sydney, only had a small friendship circle, and then I was putting myself in out of my comfort zone completely. I signed up for boxing. I did my first four amateur fights. I um, was doing a bunch of stuff that was just, very new to me. Awesome. And then I was feeling good and, and I, was, I launched Living in Sydney and it, it went gangbusters. It helped Living really, you know, get mainstream with mm-hmm. bigger companies and bigger organizations and get in the hands of, you know, more people because it's more dense population there than just this little pocket in the Gold Coast. And then I was like, and I met Nadia in Sydney when she was working. And then I was always, I had this goal of moving to America after I had a couple of little small roles acting back in Australia I found this presence in it, like yep. this. Mm. Uh, it took away every thought and feeling that I had in my brain in terms of my own life, and it made me just reduce everything to right here, right now, and just focus on what's in front of you. It's a very addictive feeling. Mm. So I was very fortunate enough, booked a couple of roles, made a decision to go to the States, and then being away from family and being away from friends, being so isolated and having to start friendships from scratch. I didn't have anyone else over here but Nadia. And then trying to organize and work with living back and forth here on Zoom was just not helpful. It was actually the catalyst, I'd say, of my downfall. Yeah. And um, my career kind of spiraled in terms of my, my relationship with living. Um, the work that I was doing, I wasn't feeling fulfilled. I wasn't uh, enjoying it like I used to because I wasn't at the cold face. I wasn't mm. helping people on the ground. I, I missed doing the things that I loved in Australia. And I didn't realize it was going to be that difficult. You know, speaking at schools, going to fundraising events, meeting the team, hanging out with the team, going to events. I did none of that here. Yeah. I was just by myself. And I missed out on all of that. And I wasn't feeling that purpose and that drive anymore. Mm. And it wasn't until... Um, after the pandemic rules and regulations shifted, I'm like, I, I need to get back on and speak to someone because I just was spiraling. And it mm. wasn't from a 
alcohol or any of that stuff. It was just my own mental health. It was really bad. And then um, got on a bunch of different medications and um, got one that I lasted for, for to a year and a half, Lexapro. And then I recently got off that whenever that was not long, not too long ago. And then I, um, I went cold Turkey for a bit trying to, trying mm-hmm. to navigate life again. And I tight traded off that as best as I could, mate. But that, that feeling coming off that was the worst feeling in my life. Yeah. I've never been as suicidal in my life. What as is it? Was. Yeah. So what does it look like? I mean, cause I've, I've never been on antidepressants. Um, no people that have obviously, yeah, you're, not there suppo- is, you're not supposed to give um, up cold Turkey. Yeah. So, so, so <laughs> yeah. What, what, what is the withdrawal? Like, what is that? Oh, uh, this mate that for me, and again, everyone's very different. And, um, <clears throat> pardon me. I was doing like mine was very anxious based. Like I was on SSRIs for my anxiety. I never really was sad. Like I've always had a lot of energy and I've been joyful and had fun, but my, my anxiety would steal a lot of that joy. So I was trying to manage that instead of using drinking and all that sort of stuff. So I got super fit, cut out all the shit out of my life, was super diligent, in my training and my regime, but I wasn't really treating my mental health that well. Anyway, I got off because I'm like, I've got this. I've got yep. this. Mm. I tight traded off it. So I did exactly what the doctor and that said. And I did it for like five weeks. Yep. I just gradually, gradually got off it, mate. But the, the withdrawal effects that I felt mm. was kind of like, do you know what the fight or flight feeling is? Yeah. You know, yep. when yep. Yep. Like, I felt like a shaken up soda can for 24 hours. Oh, big balmy just getting to sleep. Every day. Really? It was just on as soon as I wake up and it wouldn't turn off until I went to bed. And it's so tiring, like m- m- panic attacks, feeling so overwhelmed with any little task that could ever, like just writing a to-do list, man, it would freak me out. I couldn't even do it. I was Shit. like, what the fuck's going on? This is horrendous. And uh, it, it gets to it, the lowest point of of it all. And I made, I, I, I would be lying if I said I wasn't looking at buildings going, I'm going to jump off this. Mm. And, and, and like that were dark thoughts, like the darkest thoughts I've had since 2013. And bear in mind, man, this is just before I get married to the wife who I am yeah. now call my wife of my dreams. Yeah. And mm. I'm living in America from the outside. It all looked great. Like, oh, I'm not broke on the street or anything. I'm trying to live out my dreams. Yet all of this stuff is just too much. And I would trade it all for, for feeling good yeah. and for feeling a piece of calmness over my mind. And I remember reaching back out to my psychiatrist and said, I've I got to do something because this is horrendous. And she's like, the whole withdrawal thing, it lasts about four to five weeks. And then it started to, to, to taper back. And it was, it was actually manageable. Yeah. But I was like, let's get, let's just do something else. It's not as potent as an anti-anxiety or an antidepressant medication. Just give me something that's kind of, um, the withdrawal effects aren't going to be as bad. It's a bit more of a, uh, um, not as, not as intense. Yeah. yeah. And so I've been just trying on that now for like six to eight weeks, probably eight weeks is probably more realistic to say. And I got on that just before it wasn't the best time. Cause this was all just before I was getting married. We yeah. Going to Mexico to get married. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck, I've got to get on something. So I'm on this stuff now, which is uh, called Lamictal. And it's, um, it's like a, they use it for like people with seizures and epilepsy and stuff, yeah. but uh, you take a small enough dose and it just kind of just, gets rid of a little bit of that fight or flight stuff, that heightened tense anxiety. Yeah. And um, yeah, mate, it's very manageable now and definitely helps, but you got to, it's not a, it's not a wonder drug. I mean, you got to, you got to mix that with the combination of self-help therapy. Yeah. Exactly. It's still, still got to work. Yeah. Do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Therapy the whole lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So mate, it's, it's not like it's, it's much better than when it was around February, March. That was the, I get that by far the hardest time of my life. Yeah, yeah, but you know, and but, that's harder than the thirteen. Two thousand thirteen for me was was the worst. But props to you for for identifying it and mm. knowing. Well, ha- having the courage to go, fuck, I've got to fix this before it gets too bad. Um, yeah, when you know Dwayne didn't, you know, that's um to call it out early or at least to, you know be consciously aware enough to to go, fuck, I've got to fix it. Is you know mm. we need to hear more of that. And so, yeah, but it's sad though, man. Like so many. You think of all, and then I was trying to take a step back when I was feeling good, and I'm thinking I've got so many good things happening in life. Mm. Like there was so many amazing things happening. Like not only getting married, like I'm about to start new beginnings. I'm about to, you know, I'm pursuing something that I've wanted to do m- most of my life. And it's just like when all that anxiety and dread steals all of that joy away, it feels like yeah, like I I, I was saying it often, and I and I still to some degree say it when I'm when I get you know, a bit overstimulated. I'm like, I'll trade all of these feelings 
for anything that I have, like mm. or I own. Like I, I've, I feel like I've already got everything that I need in my life. So I'd trade it for for everything, like just to get rid of that feeling. Yeah. But yeah. then again, I then, uh, then again, I'm I'm blessed of having it because it helps me have these conversations. That's it. Yeah. And I've helped a lot of people through my my own experience. You have, man. You definitely. Yeah. Have. So so yeah. There's not many people with mental illness or, or mental struggles. I hate the word illness, but struggles that um that hasn't been touched by living, or at least mm. know what living 100%. is about and know that it's there. Mm. Well, because well, so, you guys came up with the the it ain't it ain't weak to speak. Like, it, ain't it ain't weak, weak to, speak. to speak. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's um yeah. You know that is still. I mean, it resonates with everybody. Everyone's heard it. Um, mm. so living did a massive job in sort of bringing it to the the front of. I mean, I guess I mean, I'll speak from a middle-aged white man that it was just – it brought it to my attention that it's okay to, to speak up. Mm. Yeah, there's been a lot of support, man. Living would not be where it is today without all of the support for living over the years and a lot of loss too along the way yeah. Yeah. with the, the living. And I'm glad that I, I got to, to, to do the work that I did for those amount of years and I'm, I'm equally as excited now to pass the torch on and watch it grow from the sidelines so that I can focus on something else that – stimulates me in the right ways it can bring that good feel that feel good energy into my life to make me the best version of myself yeah nice so tell yeah, us then oh sorry, sorry no go on uh, well i, I just saying. wanted to say um so you were on survivor in 2016 how did that go that's for your mental was, health that's where i was going okay. that was exactly <laughs> right, where go. i was going, I was going. Mate, speaking so of what, torches <laughs> yeah mate speaking of torches we'll segue straight into the the, the samoan jungle um <laughs> how was it on my mental health yeah oh mate best thing in the world was like it? i yep. look back yeah, so it's a question I get asked all the time, like, hey, how did you deal with this shit out there? And I was like, it was the best environment mm. for me. Like, oftentimes when I have, like, things are overwhelming, and I say this to Nadia, I go, Fuck, I just wish, you, let's let's just move to Samoa, you and me. Yeah. Let's go live on a, on a little, like, island, get rid of everything, and just live a simple life in sarongs, eating coconuts and having rice. I could do that for the rest of my life Yeah. because there was not one bit of anxiety I had out there, other think- than probably going to tribal council. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I say sure. that to my wife, and, and I find that when I, when I get too much, I'm like, uh, my 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 survivor is a, is a creek. I want to go and live and have a property that backs onto a nice little creek so that I can hear the rushing water because the rushing water just calms me. And a fireplace and stuff. Yeah. Well, see, I mean, I've oh, got that man, with my wife. I mean, I, I, I say to my wife, I'd love to sell everything up and just move to Yamba. So I, I grew up in Kingscliff, and it was just a little okay. little small beach community back then. It's a bit different now, but I sort of see Yamba, and I'm like, oh, I'd just love to go see out my days and just you know, yeah. get a little job. There's no stress and just... Kick back. Yeah, and... yeah, chill. Yeah, so then when you get... When you get um when you get given these great goals and this inspiration, this motivation and all these things, which I'm, I'm grateful to have. Um, and I'm very, you know, ambitious and stuff, but it is a double edged sword at times. If you can't, if you can't manage it correctly, because mm. we look at third world countries and, and places like India and that, and they're not wrong when they talk about the science that comes out of there, like people overall happier. Mm. And I don't, I don't know exactly what it's down to, but I think a big part of it is, is this overstimulation. There's too much happening in Western mm. civilization and, Mate, I, I really, I, I could go back there tomorrow. I probably, the, the tribal councils of the most recent survivor were probably the hardest ones. Mm. Um, but as far especially, as that removed me from all of that, I was fine. Mate. Well, especially was, since fine. you were looking like, like you were going to win and then there was like, you know, a couple of twists and bits and pieces. <laughs> yeah, it was horrendous. That, that, <laughs> of the latest one, yeah. Oh, mate, I, I felt like for the heroes versus villains one, the one that just went, I, I felt so good in that game. I was, I yeah. could have, I could have done that for another 50 days without, without a, without a flinch. Awesome. I was in my prime and that, that tribal council where I went home, man, that just, that it was not meant to happen, but I mean, it was, it was, it was all meant to happen because that's just why it happened. Now, can I ask you something, right? Have you, uh, you were on survivor. You did all that. Have you seen the show alone? Like, Oh no, 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 I haven't. But I met someone out here just recently who was on it. What is it? Okay, so there, oh uh, my places. god, there's this amazing show, and there's like eight series or something of it now, and they've just done an Australian version, and they're doing it all over the world. They literally dump ten people with a swag of essentials. Mm. They say no food, but it's essentials to survive. So, like, but you can't have a lighter; you've got to have a flint. So you, mm. you've got to light your own fires and stuff like that. Um, you're given like tarps and stuff like that to build a house, to build a, a hut, and you stay out there for as long as it, as long as you physically can surviving off the land and you have to film yourself 
Um, and then the one that lasts the longest wins, you know, like 250 grand or a million bucks or whatever it is at the moment. But, um, That's but yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. But someone like Sam would probably never fucking come back. Nah, I I honestly think I'd win that game because the the big the hardest thing about Survivor and people always ask this is like, what's the biggest challenge about it? When you're getting put out, I didn't do Fiji. So season one was Samoa, season eight was Samoa. I've only known Samoa. I was the only one out there on this last last season who'd done Samoa. Everyone else that returned done Fiji or Australia. Yeah, the weather is the worst. So mm. we didn't have tarps or anything. And when it rains, you don't have food. And you don't have mm. food when it rains, and you certainly can't sleep. They're the two of the hardest things that you struggle with on an island like Samoa. The weather is so unpredictable. If you took out the weather aspect or you had a tarp from day one, mm. mate, I, there, wouldn't be, there wouldn't even be a problem. I mean, the fending for your own food, we were given a bit of rice and beans. I get that. Mm. But there's something nice about having your feet on the earth in a place like a jungle or yeah. wherever a lion's filmed. Like this, some people just thrive in those environments. Yeah. Well, Alone Australia is filmed in Tasmania. They dumped them oh, in the it? cold. Oh, that's it's, um, And it, they, they sent them to an area. I was watching part of the series on SBS. They sent them to a part where it rains 260-odd days a year, I think it is. Oh, so no, yuck. They have yeah, to that, deal with the elements, bad. and it's cold. And it's at the bottom of Tasmania, so you're the closest to Antarctica. And, like, they were yeah. cold and it gets rained on and they have to fend for themselves. Well, see, getting dry yeah, would be oh, one oh, of the oh, hardest yeah. things to deal with, right? Like, fuck, imagine not being able yeah. to get warm and dry. Yeah, that's the worst. And, like, it, we're in a tropical place like Samoa, how often it rains, nothing dries when you're in a jungle. It's yeah, just stays humid. damp. It's wild, yeah. eh? Like, it's it's annoying. But it was so fun. Yeah, I, I always say to people, if you can ever experience the kind of challenges like that, just put yourself out in the wild. They're the best, best experiences. I'd love to. I'd do it again, man. I'd do it again for sure. Well, I think we've taken up enough of your time this morning, um, and I appreciate wow. you jumping on. Um, and 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 LA sounds like it's its own survivor. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. It definitely is. It's a jungle. Yeah, it is a definite. It's a different time for jungle, but yeah, you got to sidestep every now and then. That's for sure. And the it's tribal uh, councils would be your auditions, wouldn't they? Yeah. Mate, oh, they're, well they're, played. Uh, there you go. Brutal. Yeah, they are brutal. But, um, yeah, you just got to persist, never give up. And, um, yeah, every single day something new can happen, you know, that can change your mindset. So it's kind of like you just got to hold on sometimes as bad as things are in life. So if anyone's listening, just remember that. Stay positive as best as you can. If you don't know how to stay positive, pull out your phone, go and look at quotes, read, research, mm. jump on blogs, listen to these podcasts. They help. They can change mm. your life. Yeah. And listen to your own podcast. You've got one? Yeah, yeah, I've got one. They can come and listen to It Ain't Week to Speak, and that's on all of the places where you get your podcasts. So, yeah, feel free to jump over and listen to that. It's pretty fun. Well, Sam Webb, um, congratulations. From, from a personal perspective, thank you for, for everything that you've done with, with living. Um, you've definitely made the conversation a lot easier for people that suffer with depression. Um, so from, from a personal note, I want to say thank you for that. Ah, of course. Thank you. And yeah, appreciate the support and the kind words. And thanks for sharing some of your own journey, man. Appreciate it. And, um, and best of luck with this new adventure that's going to get announced soon. Yeah. Yeah, mate. I appreciate it. Um, fingers crossed sooner rather than later. But either way, whatever I do, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Brown. Punk. Legend. Absolute legend. What he's done for mental health across the board mm-hmm. is und- undeniable. He's helped so many people. And he's a great talker and he, he's helping with the um, with just... It ain't weak to speak, the, the whole motto about what he's been doing in the past. And I mean, yeah, he's doing other stuff like Survivor. He's become a star because of Survivor and, and things like that. But but ultimately, um, his talking about mental health is is done wonders for a lot of people. And I, I'm, I'm glad that I actually had the chance to tell him that. Well, that's so good. And what I got out of it was being the, the mate that somebody might talk to because... I've you are that really, person. Yeah, but I've never really known what to say or what to do. And um, I think hearing him say, just, you know, be there. You don't yeah. have to have the answers. I think is, um, it's, a, it, it, it's a beautiful thing. I love it. Well, you very rarely have the answers, but you're always there. Well, see, that's, see maybe I was inadvertently doing it. See, I didn't even know. It's, yeah. <laughs> I have no answers, so I'll just be here. Exactly. And that is enough. 
And nice. I'm always um, here. Big always. thanks to Grow Clinics um, for their ongoing support of our podcast. Go to growclinics.com.au. They've got lots of stuff in the pipe work as well, so there's, there's big announcements coming up there very soon. You can go to our own website, which is brownpark.com.au. Thank you very much for, for going there and, and checking out the articles and and buying a T-shirt. It's cold. You can wear a jumper. No pressure. No pressure. But, but do it, goddammit. <laughs> uh, and we will see you next time on the Brown Park Podcast. See you. The Brown Park Podcast.